My beloved brothers and sisters, <clears throat> here we are again in this historic tabernacle on Temple Square in Salt Lake City to consider matters of importance to the world, to the members, to ourselves. The past few months have been most interesting to us. During February and a few days of March, we toured the South Pacific countries and islands of the sea. A large party of representatives from the church, including some of those in highest authority, went to the southern hemisphere <coughs> and spent a little time with the ever-growing, <coughs> fast enlarging communities of the South Pacific. Because a large proportion of the people, the more than 100,000 people in the South Seas, would not ever be able to come to Salt Lake City to the General Conference, we determined to take an area conference to them. So in New Zealand, three large cities of Australia, Samoa, Tonga, Fiji, Tahiti, we held conferences for the saints wherein they could meet the general authorities, have an opportunity to vote upon their leaders, and hear sermons from the leading authorities of the church. We were well received, well treated, and returned with a great affection for the good people of that Southland. You'll be interested to note that the church is growing rapidly in many foreign lands, as well as our own country. We now have members of the church in 66 countries, and we teach the gospel in most of these lands. We have 23,000 plus missionaries, with over 2,000 of them who are local boys and girls from the nations which they teach. Whereas, <clears throat> when I was made the president of a stake in Arizona in 1938, it was the 124th stake in the world, whereas now we have 750 stakes, and whereas we have only a little more than a score of missions then, when I filled my mission, we now have 134. We envelop much of the vast world which we inhabit with congregations in South America, the Orient, the South Seas, South Africa, Europe, many other places. There are numerous tens of thousands of people who find each year the gospel is satisfying to their spiritual needs, and br we bring in great numbers of people. Our general authorities cover the world constantly and spend their energies trying to take to the new areas and the peoples the training and teaching that are necessary for new members of the church. Our work for the dead has greatly increased, and with the 16 temples and the more uh, continuous, unabated, ever, ever increasing. New temples have been announced in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Tokyo, Japan, and in Seattle, Washington, and elsewhere there will be edifices built for the continuation of this great work for the living and for the dead. We're most grateful for the excellent response by the people of the church to our urging that gardens be planted and that fruit trees be cultivated and our places cleaned up and made more livable. We fully endorse the program of Governor Calvin Rampton in Salt Lake City calling for the planting of a million trees for a million people. From Paro and Utah we read this, in laying out the town a century ago, each family had room for a garden and some fruit trees in the back of their house. Some very fine orchards and gardens were in the public square, even down to the late 90s. I well remember the watermelons they used to produce. President Tanner and I visited a Canadian community, and on a certain street as far as we could see, 
were lovely, well-kept homes and beautiful gardens. It was wonderful, and they were varied, and the products of those gardens most delicious. Everywhere we go, we, are bu uh, we see backyards with beautiful gardens, a few rows of corn, some carrots, potatoes, onions, squash. In some places, flower gardens have been turned over into vegetable gardens or have shared the area. Another commendable thing about gardening is the exchange of products by neighbors and the fostering of fellowship and neighborliness. Another family wrote, Our old rickety barn is down, and beautiful garden is in its place. Had we realized how proud it would have made us to have a beautiful garden where the old fallen barn stood, we should have done it long ago. From another member from a rural area is this. The old, leaning, half-fallen barn is attractive now. It's repaired, newly painted. We are very proud of it and hope you will pass by and look at it. And that <clears throat> Another party writes, we live in a large forest area. I got my boss to go in with me and we rented a large vacant lot not far away that had no trees. We had it plowed, disked, fertilized, and did we ever have a garden? In the National Geographic magazine last month, we clipped a picture of a woman bringing bottled and canned fruit to her storage room which was full of the products of her labors, and is neat and tidy. That's the way the Lord planned that we should prepare and eat our vegetables. On the whole, we're very proud of the success. <clears throat> we learned that 51% of the United States households plan a garden for this year, 1976 and that there will be plenty of lids and canning jars this season. The garden fever has, attra has attacked many people. Tomatoes appear to be the most popular vegetable, followed by leaf, leaf lettuce and squash. The garden is not only for the saving of funds, but for the satisfying of a hobby desire. It's estimated that some 35 million home vegetable gardens in 1976 will be an increase of two and a half million over last year, and that about 41% of all American households will do some canning this year. That is more than other years. We commend to you the garden fever. If every family had a garden and rural families had a cow and chickens, some fruit trees and a garden, it is amazing how nearly the family could be fed from their own lot. We believe in work for ourselves and for our children. We go to the welfare projects and there we contribute work hours to meet our production needs. We should train our children to work and they should learn to share the responsibilities of the home and the yard. They should be given assignments to keep the house neat and clean, even though it be humble. Children may be given assignments also to take care of the garden, and this will be far better than to have them for long hours sitting at a television. Someone has said, nobody ever lost his shirt when his sleeves were rolled up. <coughs> Too much leisure for children leaves them in a state of boredom, and it's natural for them to want more and more of the expensive things for their recreation. We must bring dignity to labor in sharing the responsibilities of the home and the yard. From a forest ranger this came. In one day, 500 of your young adults picked up litter, rocks, debris, and painted over 400 camp and picnic tables, bridges, and toilets. 27 stakes participated in this project. It was a monumental success. The enthusiasm, vitality, and giving spirit showed by these gr this group of young working young people 
is exemplary of the finest traditions and teachings of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It is amazing what our youth can do when given assignments and direction. President Brigham Young said, My faith does not lead me to think that the Lord will provide us with pigs, bread, and already buttered bread. He will give us the ability to raise the grain, to obtain the fruits of the earth, to make habitations, to produce a few boards, to make a box. And when harvest comes, giving us the grain, and it is for us to preserve it, to save the wheat until we have one, two, five, or seven years provisions on hand, until there is enough of the staff of life saved by the people to bread themselves and those who will come here seeking for safety. Let nothing go to waste, we counsel. Take things calm and easy. Pick up everything. Let nothing go to waste. I'm still quoting Brigham Young. Be prudent. Save everything. Once you get more than you can take care of, ask your neighbors to help you consume it. And still quoting from Brigham Young, Never consider that you have bread enough around you to suffer your children to waste a crust or a crumb of it. If a man is worth millions of bushels of wheat and corn, he is not healthy enough to suffer his servant girl to sweep a single kernel of it into the fire. Let it be eaten by something and pass again into the earth, and thus fulfill the purpose for which it grew. Remember, do not waste anything, but take care of everything. There is not a family in this city where there are two, three, four, or five persons, but what can save enough from their table from the waste made by their children, and what must be swept into the fire and out of the door, to make pork sufficient to last them through the year, or at least all they should eat. Go to the poorest family in this community, and I will venture to say that they waste rags enough every year to buy the school books they are needed for their children and do even more. If you wish to get rich, save what you get. A fool can earn money, but it takes a wise man to save and dispose of it to his own advantage. It is to our advantage to take good care of the blessings of God that are resting upon us. If we pursue the opposite course, we cut off the power and glory of God designs we should merit. It is through our own carelessness, frugal, carefulness and frugality and judgment which God has given us that we are enabled to preserve our grain, our flocks and herds, our wives and children, houses and lands, and increase them around us, continually gaining power and influence for ourselves as individuals and for the kingdom of God as a whole. That was from the discourses of Brigham Young. With regard to debts, Brigham Young said this, Pay your debts. We will help you to do so, but do not run into the debt again. Be prompt in everything and especially to pay your debts. We used to preach much about the paying of debts, but of these days we have come into a position where everything we are encouraged to spend, to buy on time, to buy ahead of time, take next year to pay. In 1830, in the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord gave a revelation to Martin Harris. Pay the debt that thou hast contracted with the printer. Release thyself from bondage. A man who will run into debt when he has no prospect of paying it back again does not understand the principles that should prevail in a well-regulated community, or he is willfully dishonest. A man who will not pay his honest debts is no Latter-day Saint if he has the means to pay them. It is bad enough, quite bad enough, to borrow from an enemy and not to repay. To do this is beneath the character of any human being, but all who will borrow from a friend 
and especially from the poor, are undeserving the fellowship of the saints if they do not repay. In a letter pertaining to a divorce clearance, the following appeared. It appears that the cause of this divorce was financial irresponsibility on the part of the husband and poor money management on the part of the, both the husband and the wife. The applicant states that she has no knowledge of any unfaithfulness on the part of her husband. He stated emphatically that he was never untrue to his wife during their marriage, and yet they were so had such difficulty getting along financially that they sought to terminate their marriage. Here's a family who may have been still intact and happy with each other if it had not been for a lack of budget uh, working. We talked to you last conference about a carefully planned budget for every family. Such will save many families quarrels and many understandings. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? And this, the statement of the Lord himself, is very strong and important to us. Some may wonder why the general authorities speak of the same things from conference to conference. As I study the utterances of the prophets through the centuries, their pattern is very clear. We seek in the words of Alma to teach people an everlasting hatred of sin and iniquity. We preach repentance and faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise humility. We seek to teach people to withstand every temptation of the devil with their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. We teach our people to never be weary of good works. And that comes from Alma. The prophets say that some, the same things because we face basically the same problems. Brothers and sisters, the solution to these problems have not changed. It would be a poor lighthouse that gave off a different signal to guide every ship entering the harbor. It would be a poor mountain guide who, knowing the safe route up a mountainside, took his trusting charges up unpredictable and perilous paths from which no traveler returns. I feel a special urge today to invite all people everywhere to investigate the restored gospel of Jesus Christ with its doctrines of salvation and of exaltation. To all who hear my voice this day, I proclaim in all sincerity and truth that this, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is literally the authorized kingdom of God upon the earth today. The Master and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, stands this church in all his majesty and glory. He directs his affairs through his divinely appointed and sustained prophets and apostles. As one of the humblest of these, I raise my voice from the very tops of these beautiful mountains to declare that this church of Jesus Christ, commonly, commonly referred to as Mormonism, is the power of God unto salvation. I promise you all in truth that one of the most important days of your life will be that day on which you determine to investigate the restored gospel. That, that decision will open to you vast vistas of revealed gospel truths and countless avenues through which to develop spirituality and love and peace. You will better understand your relationship to deity. There will be answered for you the important questions of from whence you came, why you are here, and where you are going. Baptism into Christ's true church by proper authority opens the doors for exaltation 
in the eternal kingdoms of glory and exaltation to be earned by repentance, by righteous living, keeping the commandments of the Lord, and service to one's fellow man. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel for all the world and for all people. We proclaim the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. We proclaim the divine sonship of Jesus Christ and him crucified, that his divine sacrifice was a ransom for all mankind. We bear witness of his resurrection and that he lives today, standing at the right hand of God to guide the affairs of his earthly kingdom. As you investigate the Church of Jesus Christ, you will find it is not a religion claiming succession from Christ's earthly ministry, nor is it a Protestant religion. It is a divine restoration of Christ's earthly kingdom, organized as was his primitive church with apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, etc. In your study of this restored church, you will find wherein, herein, the divinely restored powers and authorities of the holy priesthood. By this divine authority and in no other way, the saving ordinances of the gospel are performed and are binding for all time and eternity. I testify this to all of you who hear my voice. You will find so-called Mormonism to be a growing, vibrant, and dynamic and challenging church. Indeed, a way of life touching upon every avenue of living, every facet of life. By the divine commandment, we are a proselyting church. More than 23,000 missionaries are abroad in the world today, unselfishly giving of their time, means, and talents to spread this message of the restoration. They are in most nations of the free world. Their message is to all mankind everywhere, to the world of the Catholics, the Protestants, the so-called Christian world, to the world of the Hindu, the Buddhist, the Islam, the Jews, the Shintoites, the followers of Confucius, to all people of all races and all creeds. We invite all to heed the message of the Latter-day Saint missionaries. No message will ever, you'll ever hear will have greater impact for good in your lives, both here in mortality and in the hereafter. The rewards are priceless for those honest in heart who seek the truth. The Lord said in this uh, this time, hear, hearken, O my people, O ye people of whom the kingdom has been given. Uh, hearken ye and give ear to him and uh, who laid the foundation of the earth, who made the heavens and all the hosts thereof, and by whom all things were made which live and move and have a being. And again I say, hearken unto my voice, lest death shall overtake you in an hour when ye think not the summer shall be past and the harvest ended and your souls not saved. Listen to him who is the advocate with the Father who is pleading your cause before him. And even so I have sent mine everlasting covenant into the world to be a light to the world and to be a standard for the people and for the Gentiles to seek it, and to be a messenger before my face to pre prepare the way before me. Wherefore, come ye unto it, and with him that cometh I will reason, as with men in days of old, and I will show unto you a strong reasoning. This is the restored church. This is the kingdom of God upon the earth, for it is Jesus Christ who organized this kingdom. You remember the incident when history was in bloom, when it was in the making. 
The important area of history was enacted only six or seven hundred years before Christ, and the Lord saw fit to reveal in a rather unusual way what was to come to pass hereafter. King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had re besieged Jerusalem and had taken prisoner the people of Jerusalem. Among the captives was one Daniel and his brethren. They kept their standards high and refused to drink with the king and his people. And in all matters of wisdom, the scripture says, and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in the realm. The king, Nebuchadnezzar, had a dream which he required his magicians and astrologers and sorcerers to reproduce and then to interpret. The penalty for any failure on their part was to be visited upon them, and it was a death sentence if they could not show the dream and the interpretation thereof. They pled for time to convince the king that there was no man living who could bring back the dream and its interpretation. King Nebuchadnezzar was furious and angry and commanded the destruction of these wise men of Babylon. The inspired Daniel desired of the king that they would give him time, and he, Daniel, would interpret the dream. And then he says, Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And Daniel, the inspired one, praised the Lord and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what it is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto now what we desired of thee. And now with the knowledge of the future as revealed, Daniel decreed for the living, for the lives of the soothsayers and the wise. Taken before the king, he was asked, Art thou able? to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof. And uh, Daniel said, The king's secret cannot be interpreted and revealed by the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers of the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, and maketh known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Daniel said to the king that his dream was a, be a portrayal of the history of the world. Then came the picture of the great image, with head and of fine gold and breast and arms of silver and belly and thighs of brass and legs of iron and feet of iron and clay, then the revelation continued, Thou sawest till that stone, that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, which smote the image upon his feet and that were of iron and clay, and brake them into pieces. And the various elements of which the image was made were broken into pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away. The wind had carried away the destroyed elements, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Then came the interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar represented the king of kings, a world power representing the head of gold. Another kingdom would arise and take over world domination. The interpretation included the domination of other kingdoms, Cyrus the Great with his Medes and Persians, to be replaced by the Greek or Macedonian kingdom under Philip and Alexander, 
and that world power to be replaced by the Roman Empire and Rome to be replaced by a group of nations of Europe represented by the toes of the image. Having delineated the history of the world in brief, now came the real revelation. And uh, Daniel said, and in the days of these kings, that is, the group of European nations, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. Now, this is a revelation concerning the history of the world, when one world power would supersede another until there would be numerous smaller kingdoms to share the control of the earth. And it was in the days of these kings that power would not be given to men, but the God of heaven would set up a kingdom, the kingdom of God upon the earth, which should never be destroyed or left to other people. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, restored in 1830, after the numerous revelations from divine source, and this kingdom set up by the God of heaven, would never be destroyed nor superseded, and the stone cut out of the mountain without hands would become a great mountain and would fill the earth. History unfolded and the world powers came and went after ruling the world for a little season. But in the early 19th century the day had come. The new world of America had been discovered and colonized and was being settled. Independence had been gathered and a constitution approved and the freedom given to men and people were now enlightened to permit truth to be established and to reign. No king or set of rulers could, divi could divine this history, but a young, pure, and worthy prophet could receive a revelation from God. There was, there was purpose for this unveiling of the history of the world so that the honest in heart might be looking forward to its establishment and numerous good men and women, knowing of the revelations of God and the, pro pro and the prospects for the future, have looked forward to this day, came about in a regular normal process and an inspired way. A 14-year-old boy had difficulty learning from the scriptures alone that what the future was. In a dense grove of trees, he sought the Lord and prayed for wisdom. And the time had come, <clears throat> and though the adversary, Satan, recognizing all the powers of eternity, would, which would be revealed with the gospel, did everything in his power to destroy the lad and destroy the prospects of the restoration. But in spite of him, there came the splendid and magnificent vision which came to this pure, inquiring lad. Exerting all his powers and with the strength of the Lord, the darkness was dispelled and Satan yielded and the vision proceeded with a pillar of light coming exactly over his head above the brightness of the sun <clears throat> which gradually descended until it fell upon him. The young Joseph continues, It no sooner appeared than I found myself delivered from the enemy which held me bound. When the light res rested upon me, I saw two personages whose brightness and glory uh, defy all description. Standing above me in the air, one of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved son. Hear him. 
This formal introduction by the Father to the Son was most important as this world as this would be the would be the world of Jesus Christ and the Church of Jesus Christ and the Kingdom of Jesus Christ. Questions were asked and answered and eternal truths were given. It was made clear to the young, unspoiled Joseph that if he retained his worthiness and kept clean before the Lord, that he would be responsible for the restoration of the Church and the Gospel and the power and authority of God. As Maturity came to the young, unsullied man. There came also a flood, a deluge of uh, ministrations from heaven. Commissions were given. Authority was bestowed. Information was given. And the revelations from on high continued almost without interruption, for the time had come. Conditions were ripe. Many people were ready to receive the truth in its fullness. In quick succession there came other visitors, Peter, James, and John, men who last held the keys of the kingdom. The power of the priesthood and the blessings of eternity appeared to the young man and restored the power and authority which they had held on earth. John the Baptist, beheaded by Herod, but now a resurrected being returned to the earth and laid hands on the prophet Joseph to give him the Aaronic priesthood. The great Moses of antiquity returned to the earth, a celestial being, and restored the keys of the gathering of Israel. The prophet Malachi, the prophet of the eternal work for the dead, returned to make way and prepare it for the great temple work and the restoration of the gospel to those who had the restoration of the gospel to those who had died without an opportunity to hear the gospel. It was stated to the organizers of the church when it was said by divine authority, no one shall be appointed to receive commandments and revelations in this church excepting my servant Joseph Smith, for he receiveth them even as Moses. And the prophet Moroni appeared unto Joseph and spent great and long hours, quantities of time, explaining to Joseph the peopling of the American continent of the Leites, And the book which would be unearthed and translated would be a further testimony of the coming of Christ to the Americas and the Book of Mormon for both Jew and Gentile. And this record, the Book of Mormon, would hold would help establish the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. These were the beginnings of accomplishment, and the gospel is revealed line upon line and precept upon precept, and truths were restored, and power was given, and authority was restored, and gradually enough light and enough people were there for the organization of this kingdom of God, which Daniel saw, uh, half a millennia ago. The church was organized, small it was, with only six members, and compared to the stone cut out of the mountain without hands, which would break in pieces and would roll forth and fill the whole earth. Rough days were ahead for the little kingdom. Prophets were assassinated. Persecutions and drivings were taken place and have vexed the fast-growing little church. A great exodus to the mountains of the West was directed by revelation. The colonization of the West occurred. Great tribulations have been suffered. Blood has been spilled. Hunger was, has taken its lives. But today the stone rolls forth to fill the earth. 23,000 young missionaries proclaim to thousands of people in their home areas and testify to its truth. The gospel appears to the nations of the earth in its approach toward the promise made by God through Daniel to fill the whole earth. And numerous people of all nationalities and tongues are accepting the gospel in many nations and the church and kingdom grow and develop. We say to you and testify to you that it shall be, in Daniel's words, 
never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall stand forever. The numerous revelations have been clear to the members that eternal life, which is their goal, is available by having the ordinances performed and then living the commandments of God. We give these truths to you not in arrogance nor worldly pride, but with a deep sincerity and a kindly offer, the gospel without price, the gospel of truth, the gospel of salvation and exaltation. I know it is true. I know it is divine. I know it is the little stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands. I know it will fill the earth as prophesied and commanded by the Savior, Jesus Christ. In his last moments in regular mortal life, he said to his eleven apostles, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. I know it is true from the birth of Adam to the days of Daniel, and from the days of Daniel to Joseph Smith and to this day. I know it is true and divine. We offer it to you without Christ. We promise to you life eternal if you will follow its precepts strictly. And I bear this witness to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.